So uh, I'll throw it open to the floor. I can't see absolutely everybody, but if you would indicate uh, your request to uh, ask a question or make a comment, um, a microphone will come to you. And uh, additionally, if you could uh, identify yourself and the organization that you represent, um, please also do that uh, before your question. So who wishes to ask the first question? Yes, Mark. Uh, Minister McEntee mentioned um, in the speech of the President of France yesterday, uh, which uh, adverts to this option. And I think um, it's fair to say that the conclusion that has been drawn from the uh, events that you have adverted to over the last few years is that we do have to confront this. And uh, we have to look at uh, peace and security, which is not just a matter of markets. Uh, we have to look at um, the, uh, the security of our external borders, which is not just a matter of markets. And uh, we have to look at things, I think, in more than just a pragmatic way. I think it's not right to say that the Treaty of Rome was a purely pragmatic um, uh, initiative on the part of the six at the time. Um, you, um, Minister uh, McEntee, mentioned that among the objectives was an ever closer union among the European peoples. This is far from being just a pragmatic objective, as has been seen in the reaction in the United Kingdom, one of whose main aims was to get this removed from the objectives of the European Union. So I think we are faced with a very wide and far-reaching debate on the future of the European Union, which is not confined to purely pragmatic questions or purely questions of markets. Thank you, Park. And I suppose it was uh, inevitable that uh, President Macron's speech yesterday would uh, influence today's discussion. Uh, so, uh, Minister Linda, would you like to reply to that uh, comment? Yes, uh, I mean, the issue of more or less integration is, uh, uh, of course, uh, always on the table, has been since, uh, since the birth of the EU. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's no secret that uh, from the Swedish side, uh, we don't think that there always is the best solution to have uh, more integration in a formal way. Uh, we are not in favor of uh, big treaty changes right now. Uh, we think that uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the situation of uh, more and more citizens in more and more countries actually uh, getting um, uh, voting for parties that are uh, against closer integration is actually telling us something. I mean, who could have thought you have had such a party as, uh, as Alternativ for Deutschland having 13% in 90 places in the, uh, in the Bundestag? Um, and you have in, uh, in Sweden the second biggest party, 18% uh, in the polls, is uh, also anti-EU. Uh, and, and that is going around. So I think what is important is not to come up with uh, any, any of the big vision of, of uh, changes, but actually in delivering of what is already promised. And, and the Commission has actually put forward many, many proposals, but many times it comes to the proposal, and then <coughs> it doesn't implement it. And then there is new proposals. And we haven't even implemented the one that was agreed upon before. And I think one, that's one of the big problems with the with EU today, to have uh, too many plans that are not implemented and to have too many big visions that are uh, seen as being far away from the, from the citizens. And I think you should have both the big issues, like solving uh, climate change and uh, working for peace, uh, and the smaller issues like being able to use your phone without pay paying extra, or uh, things that are now co coming, like geo-blocking, uh, against geo-blocking, or, or against um, 
uh, portability, meaning that you, you, you can just watch, for example, Netflix in the way you have bought it, you cannot watch it all over EU. Those things that is uh, uh, normal everyday issues for people, but they, they care about. Um, and uh, that is why when it comes to Macron, I'm just so very, very relieved that it's an EU enthusiast like him who are president of France and not Marine Le Pen, that was actually the alternative. Uh, but then I don't agree with uh, some of the ways he would like to change uh, EU uh, to a, a much more, in a much more federal, federalist, federalist way. So I think that we can make more and, and better uh, things in EU, but I don't think it has to be with a common EU competence. I don't think this solution to put more competence in uh, the hands of EU, um, but more cooperation. I can take the example of the social summit in Sweden, where many people think that, okay, but we have to have uh, more competence to uh, EU to decide on our social issues in each member country. I don't think that's the right way to go. I think it's the right way to go to have some minimum standards. For example, uh, that there should be a law that you should have um, uh, vacation, which was not the case in in UK actually, uh, or um, that there should be a directive on working hours, things like that. But it should be up to each country to decide what kind of, of social welfare system uh, you want, and then use EU in a way to inspire each other to have the same, um, uh, to, to share experiences uh, and to put the issues uh, on the agenda. And, uh, Mr. I suppose just to, to reiterate my <coughs> point um, in that if the EU was perfect then we wouldn't be having this discussion and I think um, all those years when it was established there are a lot of the key um, values and, and core reasons that still apply to today, but the reason that we have seen the, the outcome in the referendum, I think, is because it doesn't work in all of its um, in all of its forms. So I think the discussion has to very much focus now on how it can work for its citizens and how citizens can become better engaged and better involved in that conversation. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we have. Um, I think it's going back to, to what Anne has said. It's 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 bringing it right back down to how it impacts on people's daily lives. It's you know it's the broadband, it's the the or the, the roaming, it's um, it's the jobs, and and you know the most important element of um, people's lives at the moment is ensuring that they have a job that they're able to support their families, and and that's why some of our key priorities here in Ireland are focusing on jobs and growth, focusing on the single digital market, and the other key areas as well. We can't ignore those. We're talking about uh, security and defence and peace and security. That has changed since the Treaty of Rome and that has changed um, through the digitalisation of terrorism online, through um, the attacks that we've seen happening on our streets and, and how random they are. And to, to quote our Taoiseach, we are a... a, we are a I forget his quote now. <laughs> we are... Um, well, we are <laughs> we are a republic of opportunity, but we are a that neutral. Was, that was Alan Jukes we, for the record. Yes. <laughs> we are a neutral country, but we're not neutral to terrorism. So I think we, you know, the debate has to start changing, and you know, while many aspects would still remain from back then, there's, there's a change in direction now. Thank you, Minister. Any other questions? Yes, I'll start with you, Alan, and then uh, we see it with Brexit is that the, 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 the notion of ever closer union doesn't really mean anything immediate to most of the population. And I think that we really have to flesh it out. For example, the fact that Minister Lynn doesn't have to pay roaming charges here is a part of ever closer union. The fact that we now have cheaper airfares than we've had for quite a long time is a part of ever closer union. The fact that we have made uh, some strides, for example, in dealing with problems in the financial sector is part of ever closer union. And I think that any um, efforts that we make uh, to, to pursue 
uh, the improvement of, of people's lives has to be put into that context. I mean, ever closer union means nothing to 99% of the population other than a bit of blow or political puff. We have to show that it means something. Um, the other point that I think is going to be very important during the course of whatever we decide uh, to do uh, is to, 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 to deal with the issue which has become entrenched in the public consciousness that there is this awful, quote, democratic deficit, unquote, in the European Union. Uh, despite the fact that decisions are made by ministers who are appointed by governments, who are elected by people, and despite the fact that, um, although very few people know much about it, we have a European Parliament, which in many respects has far more direct influence on what the European Union does than many national parliaments have on their own situation. For example, I was a member of the Doyle for 21 years, and I would frequently have given my right arm to have the same influence on the Irish budget as the European Parliament has on the European budget. And that is not known. Uh, and un until we deal with those kinds of issues, uh, we're going to be really talking in the wind um, about the future development of, of the EU. And there are so many things uh, which both ministers have touched on here that can actually be done to improve the lot of citizens and show them what it means to have an ever closer union. Thank you for the opportunity to make the rant. So it, it, it's this theme of communicating Europe, which we were talking about a little bit earlier, and uh, Mary Cross was talking about. Do, do either of you wish to uh, reply to that? Yes, a, a few comments. I think you're perfectly right that there's uh, a lot of the uh, steps that are taking for for uh, for people making people's lives better are uh, steps that are ever closing uh, closer union. And I would I would lift the inner market, the single market. Uh, Sweden is uh, a very export-oriented country. Uh, the export goes for about 45% of the GDP. 1.4 million uh, Swedes has a job to go to because of the export. And 74% of our export goes to the inner market. Uh, so of course, every time we make it easier, for uh, our companies, both small and medium-sized and big, to, to export more to the inner market, that means something for, uh, for jobs and, and for growth. And that is, uh, I, I think it's a huge success that we, don't, we nearly don't think about it. I mean, you don't, you don't speak about, uh, when, you go, when you go to a, to a meeting about the EU, you, you don't speak about the inner market and how important it is. Uh, you speak about Brexit or, uh, or the energy union, but you don't speak about this, which is maybe one of the most important things uh, for an uh, ever uh, closer market. And I, I think that the UK will actually see how much it means when they, when they leave it. The second thing is the democratic deficit. I, I think that um, this is important because many people who talk about the democratic deficit uh, is talking about a deficit if you had a federation. But we don't have a federation. So I don't um, uh, accept the notion of a democratic deficit like you should, uh, you should um, uh, have an elected uh, uh, government or that you should have more decisions taken because EU is not a federation, it's a mixture, it's unique. And therefore I think the democratic deficit is not in the EU institution, but it is that you don't, for example, use the national parliaments more. And that, I say, coming from the country in Europe who has the most rules on letting the national parliament into EU decision. Uh, that there is no minister who can go to any council before having the mandate from the parliament uh, uh, in Sweden. Uh, that is... <laughs> Uh, I, I nearly said painful. I didn't mean that. <laughs> but you really have to go there every week. Uh, and I who goes to many council meetings. I have to go there all the time. And I have to get an agreement from the parliament before I can say anything. And sometimes they don't agree. 
And that means that you have uh, the, the democracy by getting your parliament so much involved in what Sweden actually is, have, what kind of position Sweden is having in, in all the council meetings. Um, I think that uh, when, when uh, President Macron speak about getting uh, more democrat democratic, um, uh, getting the people to be more democratic involved in EU by having uh, those democratic conventions, uh, that's fine. But it's, it's, I think it's more important to have it in the rules and regulation of, of dealings with the national parliament, to having it formally in your democratic system in, in the government, and so on, that uh, I think many countries uh, have a great potential for improvement in this case. Yeah. Just, I suppose, to touch on, again, we're talking about communications and the disconnect, and um, it, it is getting that message back, and I suppose we hear that the higher figures in Ireland, we have access to 500 million people, we know that, um, you know, over the last, or, or through our entire term as members of the European Union, We've received 42 billion more than we've actually put into it. But I mean, how do you get that across to people? Where does that filter down? It's it's finance to our farmers. It's um, it's support for our small and medium enterprises. It's it's funding for our leader programs, which then trickle down into the communities and, and to our individuals. So I think we perhaps need to be able to get that message across better. Unfortunately, in the age that we're in now, as I mentioned earlier, straight bananas and and everything else that comes along when we try and make these arguments, we possibly haven't been as good at refusing um, the various different challenges that are put before. So I think there needs to be more work done in that regard. And myself and Anne spoke about a, a format that they have, um, whereby certain issues within the European Parliament are brought um, together. It's called a... Issue Council. Issue Council. Um, and we have something similar here in Ireland, but we perhaps haven't focused on the European issues, so our Citizens' Assembly a lot of the issues that have come up there have been more domestic issues, but I think perhaps that's a mechanism that we could use either to, to, to get further understanding from our citizens what they want us to be focusing on, but also for us to put forward ideas and to see what kind of a response comes back. But this is what we're exploring at the moment. This is what we, we need to be able to do to communicate to people um, exactly how the European Union has had a positive impact on their lives and also to make them realise that while Brexit is happening, you know, I think there's a sense that all of our exports, all of our trade is with the UK, but we know that it's now only at 16 or 17 percent, so there's a whole world out there that we need to open up to. Okay, Dermot. Thank you. Uh, Dermot Scott, member of the Institute. It's me again, I'm afraid, Minister. Um, Brexit will uh, change the dynamics of the EU considerably, and from Ireland's point of view, it'll pose a lot of difficult issues because uh, in so many cases, we had similar, not always, but we had similar issues, similar interests to the, to the British. And so the loss of the large country that shares our interests is going to pose certain problems. Uh, we will be looking for new friends and alliances to, to build. Now, I expect you to say politely that, of course, you will build one with Ireland. But I'm wondering, what is it, what is, how does Sweden see this issue? Do you see the loss of Britain as being a problem for the dynamics from your point of view? And how do you see yourselves trying to, to look out for the future? Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, Brexit isn't good for anybody. I mean, it's, it's, it's not good for us. It's not good for EU. And I certainly don't think it's good for UK. Um, for, for Sweden, as, uh, um, it has two aspect, aspects. One economic aspect, since uh, UK is one of our biggest trading partners. Uh, even if it, uh, we lost 16% last year, uh, and it uh, went down several places in, in, uh, in, uh, on the list on um, who we're trading with, um, you cannot say for sure that it's because of Brexit, but it's a fact anyway. Uh, but there is also, of course, the political uh, side, where uh, Sweden is the country th that votes most together with UK, or UK is the country that votes vote most uh, with Sweden uh, in, uh, of all the countries. Uh, we have very, very similar views, uh, being free traders, 
uh, being a uh, lot of uh, <coughs> in our market, uh, jobs and growth uh, oriented. But also the first thing we did after Brexit was to give uh, all ministries uh, the task to, to see how do we cooperate with UK in EU and on what areas. And what came back was that in all areas except social affairs and labour market, mm -hmm. Uh, environment, development aid, culture, in everything we voted and, and cooperated with the UK. So it was not only on the free trading side that everybody knows from the beginning you, that we and, uh, work, but, but in all, all other areas. So uh, that uh, means that it will be a big loss for us. What we have done now is to, um, we have uh, let our agencies, uh, six or seven uh, decisions from the government to make different reports on all different areas. What will it mean for, for customs? Uh, what will it mean for, for uh, different voting patterns? Uh, everything. Uh, and then we have got the report back so that we could be better prepared in the both in the negotiations and when they have left. Um, one of the things we, we, we gave to our, uh, one of our institute was to see uh, if UK leaves, where are our allies in different uh, issues? Because what we have to do now is, of course, to, to, find, uh, to be more active in finding uh, allies. Of course, Ireland but also Germany will be much more important for Sweden than it, uh, than it has been. Even if we, there is not one single country that is so um, uh, close to us than UK. So now we have to see in those issues we could work more together with this country. In those issues we could work more together with this uh, country. And that is uh, what we are uh, trying uh, to do now. When it comes to, to Ireland, we very much support Ireland in, in, um, uh, in the, the Brexit issue. We think it's fundamental, uh, and a fundamental issue to find a solution where you could keep the Good Friday Agreement, but that you also could, could keep um, the um, the, the people, uh, the possibility for people to, to go freely uh, and goods. But I often tell um, the situation with Norway because every, in, in the beginning, UK say, okay, let's do like Norway and Sweden, it's so easy. But it's not so easy. <laughs> uh, because Norway is a member of the single market, uh, and that means that it's a free, f uh, free circulation of, of, of people. That's not a problem at all. But they are not members, they are not fully members of the uh, custom unions, uh, and that means that the custom uh, uh, procedures are very, very difficult between Sweden and Norway. Uh, and when we did a survey on 2,000 companies in Sweden, which country is the most difficult to trade with? Norway was number one. <laughs> <laughs> then came Russia and China <laughs> and others. And the reason is the customs uh, uh, procedures. And there is also the tariffs. Uh, I, I guess that nobody uh, in this room could even expect how much uh, Swedish cheesemaker has to pay for a tariff to, to sell a Swedish cheese in Norway. And the right answer is 277%. And in Denmark it's 0% because it's the uh, inner market, the single market. Uh, so you can, you can understand that these this are, are so many things you don't think of. And that will, of course, be uh, especially for Ireland with all the goods going back and forth. This will be a, a major uh, issue. Then, of course, I should say that in Sweden there is also big, big shopping centra uh, by the borders where, uh, <laughs> where the Norwegians come and buy cheese <laughs> and, and uh, other things uh, also. But, but for, for, for the customs, that is a big, big problem. Okay.
I hope there's nobody here from the IFA who's having a fit of the vapors <laughs> listening to all of that. So uh, the gentleman there, uh, yeah. Um, George Antonescu, member of the Institute. Um, I just, I'm um, just going to have a, a brief uh, question. Um, we're talking about the future of um, the EU, and um, one of the main goals, as I mentioned earlier on, in relation to the Bratislava um, agenda was um, uh, security. And I'm um, just going to, in the context of, um, uh, I know um, Sweden um, recently um, joined uh, NATO in an exercise, Aurora 17, I think it's called, uh, in the context of Safad, is uh, Sweden willing to go down the road of uh, joining NATO uh, in this context or, um, you know, uh, in the uh, President Macron yesterday, security was featured uh, very highly and um, he talked about the European defense uh, strategy and I'm wondering if um, Sweden is willing to go down that road and support the European strat uh, defense strategy or join NATO and secure We have our um, policy of military non-aligned, uh, and we will keep that. There are uh, parties in the parliament who are in favor of joining uh, NATO, um, but there is uh, no uh, majority in the opinion for joining NATO, and the current government uh, has no plans whatsoever to, to join NATO. We have, though, uh, the last years signed uh, several bilateral agreements between Sweden and USA, Sweden and Germany, Sweden and Finland for closer cooperation in, in the uh, defense uh, sector. Aurora is the biggest uh, military exercise since 1993 um, and uh, it's uh, there is, uh, there is not uh, a NATO part of it at all, but other or, uh, countries are invited, like France, like USA, who are uh, NATO countries, but th that's on a bilateral invitation. Uh, when it comes to the defense uh, of e and the security <coughs> issues in the EU, um, we think it's good that there is a good cooperation on security matters, be it uh, military or non-military, for example, to improve um, uh, EU activities in, in, uh, on missions, like in Sahel area or so on. We are definitely against a common European army, that is nothing, but we are not against having a, a good coordination of issues so that, for example, we exercise uh, um, uh, with NATO countries and so on with no problem because we cooperate, we have cooperated actually in all, all NATO missions uh, uh, <coughs> abroad in, in, uh, in um, countries like uh, when it was in, in the Baltics, when it was in Africa, um, you know, that, kind of, uh, that kind of missions. Uh, of course not, don't misunderstand me, not missions like uh, we were not members in Iraq or things like that, but then in these kind of missions where you, uh, where you have um, support of, uh, of a, a problematic, problematic area that, that goes under the United Nations mandate. Uh, we have never taken part in anything that don't have a, a United Nations mandate, and we are very, very uh, strict on any mission that we take part in needs to have a United Nations mandate. Um, so I don't see a problem with having uh, no closer coordination and so on, but we don't believe in an EU army or, or something like that. Well, to add on that, I mean, we would very much share the views around the idea of a, um, a European army. There are ways to be supportive and to be involved, but without hindering, I think, other member states views and we've seen recently our, our, I suppose, joint agreement within the Dáil to join the uh, Project SOFIA and obviously as a country we have a very proud tradition and history around peacekeeping and that's something that we want to continue into the future. Um, again, when we're talking about security and defence, there are many other formats that it takes now, particularly around cyber security and we very much welcome the Commission's um, cyber security report which was published or legislation which was published last week and while it's it's very ambitious it's extremely important because we're we're in an ever-changing world um, and while we, we've discussed earlier on all the positives about the single digital markets and, and free flow of data and trade there are obviously some difficulties around that so I think that's what the Taoiseach meant as well around 
you know, being neutral but not neutral to terrorism because it comes in all its formats. So I think, again, as I said, it, it's not about hindering other member states, but certainly our position around a, a single army and that is, is very similar to Sweden's. I'm, in, uh, I'm intrigued by the, by the single market. Michael Hamill from uh, the Institute. I'm intrigued by the single market. Um, and I, I'm wondering, if you were a Swede, could you borrow money to build your house from a German bank or from a Danish bank or from a Finnish bank? Because citizens here would imagine that that should be part of the single market. And would you be able to make your insurance with a a French insurance company or a Belgian insurance company for your house or whatever it is. Uh, I'm trying to pick new things that the single market could build because if I talk to my friends who know nothing about the EU, they say, why can't I get a loan in Germany at half the cost here? Why can't I get insurance in Sweden perhaps at half the cost here? That's the single market for me. Uh, embassy of Georgia, my name is George Robashvili, I'm the charge of the embassy. I would like to thank uh, the ministers, both of you, for a very interesting uh, intervention and for very interesting answers on the questions. And my, my, uh, my, my question will be regarding the security and the safety of the European Union from the perspective of the, of the digital, uh, digital uh, side. So we all do live in the digital world and we know that the electronic uh, and the, the digital information is very much easy to be spread, and uh, it can be it can be any news can be can be reached to the most remote uh, part of any uh, country of the European Union or in the world. We know what is happening in the United States, and there are some these, the investigation is ongoing with the with the intervention uh, on the on the fake news and the intervention of the elections of the United States. We know what is happening or what, what was the fear of the Netherlands why they have avoided to go with the digital or uh, with electronic voting when the elections were over. There, uh, there were some rumors about the possibilities of the intervention in the German elections, in the French elections. We know what is happening or again there are some rumors about the, the Spanish uh, problems they have. So it's very much easy to undermine the unity and the security of any country, or especially with the European Union, whenever there is a threat coming uh, from the propaganda from any other country or from any other agencies. Uh, Minister uh, Helen McEntee, you walked us uh, kindly uh, through the history of the European Union, and you mentioned the Soviet Union when there was the, uh, the, 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 the threat coming from the Soviet Union about the uh, Russian Kremlin propaganda towards the European Union. It was against the West, and we do all remember it quite well. So it seems to us that, 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 that propaganda, that type of a propaganda is ongoing to undermine the unity of the European Union. So my, my question will be, what, what will be, what, the, what are the tools, what are the mechanisms, what is the opinion, what are the possibilities from the European Union to avoid any such of a threat? Thank you very much for this, uh, for, the, for, for this um, future answer. And of course, I cannot uh, stand and not ask you about the uh, ongoing, or not only, but uh, very, very, uh, very, uh, very nearby uh, summit of the Eastern Partnership that will be in November, uh, the 20, 23rd or 24th of November. So you know that Georgia has a very strong aspirations uh, to become the member of the European Union, and I would love to see to, to hear your your remarks on this. Thank you very much. Minister, to your final comments. Thank you. yeah, I will uh, ask my civil servant Maria Ramstedt to sit there to answer that first question. Uh, but I know, of course, I was living in uh, in Brussels and I had a Brussels Belgian bank account, and uh, and uh, there was uh, a Belgian security for my flat and so on and so forth. So I, that was absolutely no problem. But the other issues. Um, I think Maria can, can answer better. Uh, when it comes to cyber security and the issues of that, I think that there has been uh, so many evidence the last uh, years on how important this is. And that is why uh, now the EU Commission has proposed that there should be uh, cyber security um, agency, is it, or something like that. And, uh, 
and also to put more money on the on the uh, um, uh, in the budget for it. And for example, connecting with the other uh, question that the other gentleman said, Sweden is, for example, a member of the NATO Center of Excellence uh, for Cybersecurity, and we don't see that as any, any uh, going anything against our policy of mil military uh, non alignment, uh, for, for example. Uh, it is, of course, extremely important that uh, voters feel that when you, uh, when you have an election that is not manipulated by, by any other country. And uh, actually, I started my day here with uh, a visit to Facebook, and we, we discussed this matter because it's, of course, also the, the, the social platforms uh, also have... Uh, a responsibility and possibility to to see if they can see uh, what's happening that there is coming for example traffic from from uh, places that you don't um, expect it uh, massively into um, an, an election and they are looking into <coughs> those issues now um, when it comes to enlargement uh, um, Sweden has a policy of being uh, uh, in favor of uh, continuing enlargement but I have to say that um, uh, when I go to the meetings uh, that uh, with European ministers but Minister McEntee also does there is what I would say an um, uh, enlargement fatigue uh, and for the first time ever, uh, we could not agree this year to have a common position on enlargement. Uh, that has never happened before. Uh, that has nothing to do with the country uh, you represent, uh, but uh, it shows that enlargement has becoming much, much more um, controversial uh, now than it was before. So this is an issue of uh, a big debate uh, among countries, uh, and I think it will be difficult debates. Uh, but our policy uh, is that uh, we think that the EU should be a, a larger uh, union because it says in the treaty that any European country that wishes to become a member of the European Union could be that and could be able to apply for a membership, but it should have the possibility to, to um, follow all the, the criteria. But Maria, if you can answer the first question. My name is Maria Ramstedt. I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Single Market Affairs at the Swedish uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Um, on the issue of insurances and uh, is it possible, I understood the question being, is it, would it be possible to actually uh, acquire an insurance in Sweden and then go abroad? Or, or would it be possible for a Swedish building company to actually acquire uh, an insurance and, and then go abroad? And, and indeed, that is, in fact, has turned out to be, it is a problem uh, on a very uh, well, highly personal screening. Uh, I, I noticed that only one Swedish company, uh, insurance company actually do provide uh, cross-border insurances for Swedish citizens. But um, in terms of uh, actually trying to do something about it, um, there is a, a proposal just well tabled by the European Commission on the European e-services card, which in fact actually deals with this particular issue. Um, well, negotiations are going quite slow in council, uh, but it, there is a section on this particular issue. So indeed, it has been identified as an important element in terms of increasing the free movement of services. Thank you. Final words, Minister? Finally, yeah, I, I suppose this comes back to what we're talking about and what is it that citizens want? What do they want to get um, out of the European Union? And I mean, we are very much behind the full implementation of the single market, and that includes um, the services element of it as well. But then again, as has been said, you're, you're getting into difficulties with free flow of data crossing jurisdictions. And, you know, I think that's. Um, that discussion has been had but maybe isn't and hasn't been to the fore and that's something that we are keen to do moving forward. Um, with regards, again, I suppose security and safety online and, you know, uh, once again, this is, uh, this is about trying to, to compromise between freedom of speech but also from trying to, to stop 
um, stop the likes of what you're talking about happening where there is um, a, a threat or a, a threat element to it. Um, and I think we've seen that once fake news is out there or once something damaging is online, it's very hard to take back the way this online media has gone or the online has gone in itself. It is immediate, it is there and it is there for all to see forever. So I think we have to be very ambitious in this regard. Again, to repeat the Commission's report last week, I think that's an important step and I think we need to support that. But I think, again, we have to be very cautious that we don't impinge on people's right to freedom of speech while we're doing that as well. Okay, so may I thank the two ministers on behalf of the Institute and on your behalf uh, for their very valuable contributions. I think it's uh, part of the Institute's work to try to develop a uh, close relationship with other EU member states and uh, this is one, part of that uh, process. So we're absolutely delighted to have uh, these distinguished thank ministers you. here uh, to give their views on this crucial issue today. So thank you and please uh, give them your appreciation. Thank you.